it's it's really wonderful to see a full house again this morning. <clears throat> we have a wonderful set of uh, speakers this morning for our panel and uh, a great uh, uh, couple of in interactive sessions later this afternoon. And of course, uh, Peter Berkeley's keynote, closing keynote um, coming up as well. Um, it's been wonderful to see over the course of the day yesterday the amazing energy and momentum in this field and to watch uh, this, uh, to watch all of you come together with your colleagues. Um, it's it really uh, has been, uh, has exceeded my expectations. Um, uh, I just wanted to uh, do a few kind of logistics reminders before I let uh, the panelists take over. Um, that you, you have a program evaluation in your packets and that survey is also available online. We really value your feedback about this event. Um, we hope that, uh, that we hope to um, learn from this event to improve uh, our next library publishing forum and make it even better than this year. Um, poster presenters, if you uh, want to keep your poster, um, you, you'll need to make plans to take that before uh, or by the end of the, the day today. We'll need to move out of the foyer area right after the um, closing keynote. If you want to discard your poster, you're welcome to just leave it there. Um, we still have uh, some library publishing directories. There are also AAU, AAUP directories out on the registration table there that you're welcome to. Um, and we, we encourage you to, to take a look at both of those resources. <clears throat> and uh, finally, if you are not already a participant in the LPC and the past, uh, the, these two days have piqued your interest, please do get in touch with me for more information about participating in the project or to uh, receive updates as we solidify the membership model for the on ongoing organization. So uh, please uh, join me in welcoming our first panelists and our panel chair, Kevin Smith. Good morning. Um, I know a bunch of you are on day four of conferencing today, and if you were at the Coapi meeting day five. So to quote the wise words of Stephanie Davis call, good for us, <laughs> and hell yes. Uh, <laughs> just trying to wake you up. So, we have a slightly different structure for our session this morning. Um, each of our speakers is going to make a very short presentation addressing an initial question, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. And then they're going to sit down and I'm going to pose to them some questions that we've agreed on in advance that all deal with the issue of the alignment of policies and programs. So uh, all my role is at this point is to introduce them. I'm going to do that very quickly because their, bi their full bios are on the website. And they have made this easy for me by arraying themselves in order, the order in which they're going to speak. So our first speaker will be Tom Hickerson, who is Vice Provost of Libraries and Cultural Resources and the University Librarian at the University of Calgary. Our second speaker is Lisa Macklin, Lisa is the Director of Scholarly Communications Office for Emory University Libraries and Information Technology. That's a mouthful. You must have long business cards. And as both a librarian and a lawyer, Lisa focuses on copyright, licensing, and scholarly communications. So she will bring that perspective to her talk on alignment. Finally, last but not least, of course, Sorel Oberlander is the Library Director at the State University of New York at Geneseo. Uh, if you want more information about their really interesting activities, look at the website and they'll tell you some about that. But at this point, I'll simply say, Tom is going to lead us off. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, good morning to you all. And um, I'll um, just start right off by uh, uh, speaking to the uh, convergence uh, theme that the, uh, of the SPARC meeting uh, at the University of Calgary. Uh, we have a, a converged environment in that I'm responsible as well as the libraries on campus for, the, uh, um, for two different art galleries and the university press. 
And uh, that's certainly an element of my presentation today because um, the word holistic uh, in, the, uh, in the slide is probably the most important one, uh, is essentially to uh, apply a set of principles across a scope of functions and have those functions support a common goal. And uh, so that's something that we try to do in terms of libraries and cultural resources, uh, but also to make that a, a university-wide uh, commitment. And um, the other side of, uh, of that is uh, put your money where your mouth is. So um, these are not in any, um, that one's not the one I thought it was. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, um, well, I think I, I'll go back to that one. Um, I think uh, probably uh, uh, we sent the, the uh, first copy as opposed to the second copy of my slides. Um, so anyway, um, I'm gonna start out with the Open Access uh, Authors Fund. Uh, these are not in any particular order, and so this mistake doesn't really matter. Um, we had um, uh, the first such fund in, in Canada, uh, second, I think, in North America, and sixth in the world, uh, starting in 2007, 2008, so it's about five years old. Um, we uh, started off with a commitment of $100,000 a year, and um, uh, immediately had success in supporting open access um, publications in, in full open access and also hybrid journals, something that's being reconsidered at this point in time. So at this point in time, we supported the publication of over 500 uh, peer-reviewed uh, academic articles. Um, and uh, the cost has moved up to uh, 200,000 plus at this point. Um, which is something that we're looking closely at as we go forward. Um, I'll mention, and we'll probably come back to this, is, is that this actually comes from, um, is allocated from the collections funding uh, and, and libraries and cultural resources. And from my perspective, uh, open access publication is certainly an appropriate uh, use of the collections funding. I'll go on to, uh, uh, to hosting academic journals. Um, we, um, right now we host uh, 21. 16 of those are full open access. Um, they, um, that, that function was originally part of our university press, which started doing so in 1981. Uh, but recently, uh, the activity has moved to the uh, Center for Scholarly Communication. Uh, and has, does not actually give a University of, of Calgary publishing imprint, but is more focused on being a hosting service. Uh, the growth in the number of journals and the fact that more of them are, are um, open access journals was in part driven by a national uh, grant program called the Synergies Project, uh, for which the University of Calgary was a Western hub. We expect uh, a, a further increase in this area um, if, in fact, the uh, tri-agency, uh, uh, that's the three principal res federal research granting councils plus a uh, federal infrastructure, research infrastructure organization, um, passes a mandate which is a, uh, is a full open access mandate for publicly funded research to be available within 12 months after publication. Uh, this is a, is a very important one because it's one that reaches out to the uh, uh, entire university. Our copyright committee is a major activity in, uh, uh, in this area. Um, it is chaired by the university provost and she's uh, an activist chair of that committee, but it also brings together um, the university council's office, uh, obviously, uh, the library, also the university copyright officer, who is a, a, a library staff member, um, but the campus bookstore, the students' union, which also uh, has a course pack uh, 
uh, program, the Graduate Student Association, and our university IT. And its uh, implementation there is closely connected with the implementation of a new uh, um, uh, learning, manage, learning course management system uh, and, Air, and the ARIES uh, software, which allows us to examine uh, the copyright approvals uh, of all courses being taught at the university. And we have a staff of three that work full time uh, proving all, everything that goes into the classroom uh, for copyright compliance. Um, uh, very busy uh, at the end of it, at the beginning of each term. Um, well, did I come to the end of that? Well, I did. So I'm going to speak about the. Yeah, I, I see someone heading this direction. Uh, so, but it doesn't matter. The slides are really, are, are it's just, uh, it's just to, uh, okay. Okay, so, uh, University of Calgary Press. Um, and this is, is the, uh, perhaps the most important component of this program and uh, the press at, uh, at the University of Calgary is, um, uh, began in 1981 as a journal publisher. It began to publish monographs in 1984. So out of the 47 year history of the university, it's been in operation for 30 years. Um, it came to the library in the 1990s, uh, but until about six years ago, it was, it was uh, actually operated as a totally independent entity. And at that point in time, I uh, pushed to have it really become an active component uh, of our overall uh, set of university and library principles around publishing and open access. So it is now a fully open access press. Uh, every, uh, everything that comes out in print comes out the same day uh, uh, available as a, as a downloadable uh, text using the, uh, at this point, the open journal system, uh, but we do Im intend to uh, implement the open monographs uh, program as, as soon as the new version is out. Uh, Brian told me it actually came out yesterday. I uh, didn't know that. Came to the Red Hot conference here to find out the news. So, um, um, so uh, we, um, we're a relatively small press. Right now it's uh, about, about uh, 10 titles a year. On the other hand, it's, a, uh, it's an award-winning press, was, uh, wins uh, frequent uh, awards, and this year we're very pleased to have a, a uh, Governor General uh, nominee uh, literary award, which is actually a, uh, a French language publication, uh, which is the only nominated uh, French language uh, uh, publication not published in Quebec, so we're very pleased that we're uh, effective in both of Canada's official languages and uh, uh, look forward to the outcome of that. Um, we're also going back to uh, uh, reverse, uh, uh, to uh, convert the backlist to uh, open access and uh, at this point have 53 titles converted that are available and that's uh, the copyright office when I talk about uh, working in a converged uh, fashion in fact they're the ones going back and getting copyright approval and so forth with, and, and author uh, right uh, uh, transfers so that in fact that we can go back to convert the whole uh, 350 uh, title backlist so um, the, uh, probably the only other thing I should mention is, is that we also incorporate this into our collections and our reserves policy. So the provost has uh, in recent time given us an extra million two hundred and fifty thousand and a particular in our collections budget and a particular portion of that is to fund the copyright service but is also to acquire material that is needed on campus for copyright com appears to be uh, a need for uh, heavy use for copyright classroom compliance and uh, so that's part of our demand driven uh, acquisitions policy and also supports our reserve system. So we try to bring together a whole set of functions uh, in a policy alignment 
that is also synergistic in terms of use of resource and in terms of, of broad university support. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, also for ending with a statement of what I forgot to say, which is what you were all asked to talk about. You were, they were, in fact, asked to talk about the organizational structure as an underlying uh, element of this issue of policy alignment that we're going to deal with more. So Lisa, thank you for letting me interrupt to explain what I didn't say. You're just going to switch computers? No. You're not going to switch computers. OK. That's fine. Good. Good morning. So I am not the perspective from the top that Tom and Sorel are. I'm the perspective from the middle. Um, and in that perspective, I think you'll see reflected a bit um, kind of how I perceive policy and um, how I, at times, hopefully make policy alignment work for me. Um, the very long title that Kevin mentioned is due to the fact that we have had a, a merger of library and information technology services, um, which we call LITS, because it's a lot quicker and easier to say, and we like acronyms, let's face it. And so I want to give you a description of kind of what LITS is to give you some um, grounding um, when I start talking about some other things as we do our question and answer session. So, um, LITS is, as you would guess, library. Um, notice we're first, not that I'm biased. Um, Emory Center for Digital Scholarship, University Technology Services, and researcher, Research IT, which has a focus with healthcare, because Emory has a medical school and there's Emory Healthcare as well. Um, to give you a little more information about ECDS, as we call it, um, basically the Emory Center for Digital Scholarship was a way to pull together um, in one place very faculty um, and even graduate student particularly, but student facing services um, so that there was a kind of central point that people could be referred to from the multiple libraries at Emory. Um, we have either five or nine, depending on how you count. Um, so we needed a way to have a central referring service in and then also referring out. And so under ECDS is what used to be the Emory Center for Interactive Teaching, which is a resource around um, expertise and technology related um, instruction for teaching and learning that works primarily with faculty members, um, the Electronic Data Center, the Beck Center for Digital Collections, and the um, Digital Scholarship Commons or DISC. And to give you a little bit of background, DISC was kind of our first foray into um, digital scholarship, per se, and having a center around digital scholarship. And that was actually a grant-funded project to really kind of explore what is the organization model um, that would make sense. And it's then kind of just been expanded into this center for digital scholarship, um, bringing in, as I said, all of these things under the umbrella of ECDS. So, <clears throat> One thing I do want to say is that we really have not expanded our silos because that can be very easy to do in an organizational you know, restructuring. Um, instead, we really are aligning things across LITS. And when I say LITS, LITS is an organization with over 700 people. There's literally not a single meeting place on campus that's large enough to hold that group of people. And so what that means is that we're really leveraging the expertise on the IT side, the expertise on the library side, the digital technologists who know pedagogy, um, and really looking at what services, what things meet our mission from that larger perspective and have a management team you know, that, that very much has that perspective. So one thing that we don't have um, is we don't have a university press. Um, we will, I can't imagine, ever have a university press. That doesn't mean that we don't do publishing. We are at the Library Publishing Forum after all, so I know that we are in the same situation that many of you are as well. We host OA journals. We do that actually on a variety of platforms. We have done a host of digital projects and digital publications. We have an OA policy for faculty articles. Our latest project in that regard is we are implementing symplectic elements, which is a faculty profiling system, integrating that into Open Emory, which is our institutional repository, and also standing up an instance of Evo. 
Um, we're doing that in conjunction with the research IT folks. So, you know, we're leveraging expertise on kind of both sides, shall we say, of that organization for this one project. Um, and our first um, school is going to be the School of Medicine. We've also just launched an Emory Open Education Initiative to support OER. And when I say just launched, the announcements went out while I was here. So that is just launched. And um, we're doing that actually in conjunction with the Emory Center for Digital Scholarship, which has expertise in assessment of teaching because they've worked with digital pedagogy. That's an element of the Open Education Initiative. So that is an example, again, of this convergence of expertise being brought to bear. So I'm going to leave it to that and turn it over to, to Sorrell. And I'm the radical without PowerPoints. <laughs> I even get to see how much time I'm going to be up here. Thank you all, everyone. I really appreciate it. SUNY Geneseo is a very remarkable liberal arts residential campus with about 5,300 students, 241 faculty, and an incredible library of 31 employees. They are very remarkable because what I'm about to share is how much they've been able to accomplish in a relatively short amount of time. We are one of 64 campuses among SUNY. That's about um, 34,000 faculty and 467,000 students as a system. Milne provides a learning-centered environment, rich information and services to support scholarship, research, and innovation. And as one of our primary strategies, we want to transform scholarly communications. Ambitious? I love this stuff. We almost have 20% of our staff dedicated to the publishing team as members of the publishing team. That's a significant contribution. That outstanding team publishes new monographs using Open Monograph Press, mostly reprints from special collections, available as open access and print on demand. We're not shy. It's great to have some money revenue coming into our special collections budget. Now, we also produce open textbooks for SUNY at, at large. And it's an open SUNY textbook program that we administer. We published four, 11 more this year, and 16 more in 2015. We publish a few open access journals and just published Digital Thoreau, which is a digital humanities project, which we're very proud of. It's got three editions. One is a fluid text, a TEI, Text Encoding Initiative, that you can see seven versions of the manuscripts of Walden and compare them side by side. Now, it's worth mentioning that our technical services staff did this with the chair of the English department by first learning TEI and then about six to eight months later encoding the whole darn thing. That's an amazing staff. Now, it's also, Digital Thoreau is a social reading platform where we use Commons in the Box and added BuddyPress so that you can have classes of students commenting around the text of Walden and each reading each other's comments and commenting on their comments. The last edition is actually the days of Walter Harding as Thoreau Scholar and it's using an Omeka uh, platform. As for policy alignment, I often work with others in transfer agreements. I work with SUNY Council on agreements for authors for our programs, both publishing and open SUNY textbooks. But let's talk about mission of library publishing. That's one of the questions we were asked to answer, and I'll, I'll go for it. If you have read the Library Publishing Toolkit, which there's a copy over here, um, I wrote that the mission of library publishing services is based on a core value of libraries. It's about knowledge sharing and literacy as a, an essential public good. For academic libraries, that really means providing access to content that connects author and reader, teacher and learner. That's one of our core values. However, today's environment is very interesting because it's making it both easier for libraries because of information ubiquity and more challenging for libraries because of the cost of subscription content, high cost content. 
We spend about $1.5 billion a year, according to ARL libraries, on our content. It may be that we have a choice ahead of ourselves. ARL, ARL stats over the last 10 years shows that there's been a decrease in staffing in ARL libraries by about 10%. Are we procuring resources as is at the expense of our staff? Or are we going to create, curate new content in new ways that's engaging? I like to think that we're creating an academic-friendly publishing model that is yet to be created, and it's new. Transforming scholarly communication is more than removing the boundaries between content and reader. It's also about empowering the author. Shaping this new publishing ecosystem is an opportunity to rethink our models, to enrich teaching and learning, and research environments and to expand access and impact on information sharing for the lifelong learner. It's beyond our classes. It's beyond our campuses. To be successful in our mission means that we have to be promoting the learning experiences of the reader, success one page at a time, regardless of the modality, regardless of the device. The crucial transformation ahead is not simply for libraries and university presses. It's how that transformation is critical to the changing higher education model. And I really like us to explore how do we help education scale up and control cost. That said, to answer the last question, how does the publishing mission differ from the traditional publishing mission, the library publishing versus the traditional? I'd say it might be too early to tell. Um, we don't understand the forces that are making us converge at this moment. This is a comparison of the institutional mission of Geneseo, which is to provide a rich learning experience, then Milne Library, another learning-centered environment, and the publishing team, which is supporting transformation of scholarly information. University presses have their mission with the scholarly societies. Society publishers have a mission, I'm using ACS publications as one of the missions, and finally commercial publishers. Now, while, develop, while libraries develop publishing services, university presses seem required to increase their service commitments to their host institutions. They're developing a lot of trade publications also as a result. More adventurous may be the commercial publishers who are heavily investing in learning service frameworks. These free or low cost LMSs were early as a trick to market textbooks that they have, but now they're incorporating open content because they realize it's not about the content, it's about how engaging and immersive that environment can be. Now, I'm not certain that library publishing and traditional publishing aren't awkwardly moving towards the same space and mission, because publishing no longer looks traditional. And as a result, we have an opportunity to shape the authoring, reading environment, because others already are. I was asked to talk a little bit about the vision of library publishing. Let me see how much time do I have. Ah, I often say that we don't want to be a university press, and it's really important that we're not going to be. They don't need the competition, and we need to create something new. We are not going to be a commercial publisher. Rather, we're looking to develop a new form of academic-friendly hybrid publishing model that fulfills the need to better connect author, reader, teacher, and learner. So when I, like, when I look at our mission, I think we're very well aligned with the library's mission, and with the campus mission. It is about the rich learning environment. Reprinting our rare books using open access and OMP serves many things. At the least, it's expanding access to rare collections that we have. Now, we can also do other things with these reprints. We give them away as a gift to donors. 
We also raise revenue for special collections. One of the new books that we created, a memoir of James Walcott Wadsworth, Jr., a famous Missouri senator, just happened to be in Missouri, that's great, allowed us to promote our special collections. And our president of the college wrote the foreword. Connecting the administration to what we're doing in pu library publishing is really key, and they can be very excited about it. Another of our new works isn't so new. Bob Dylan's career as a Blakeian visionary and romantic. Do I need to say that again? That's a tough title. <laughs> <sighs> Professor Stelzig wrote it in 1976. It was going to be published with a bunch of scholar articles about Bob Dylan. And the publisher killed it right before it went to print because they decided, who's going to read scholars talking about Bob Dylan? <laughs> Thankfully, we were able to publish it for him. And now it's selling well, even though it's open access on the web. So we can make a difference to authors in many ways. The Library Publishing Toolkit, which is there, is really a series of toolkits that we've published that tries to give us efficiency and community. Working together will really matter. One of the most important policies is one that's unstated. Libraries connect to each other, and it's fundamental to our success and scale, and that's what we can provide higher education. Nowhere does the role of library publishing and library mission and mission to the college align so well as with learning and publishing. Some of our publishing team work really well with our faculty and students to produce journals uh, that are open access and print on demand. Students learn valuable skills, they apply them during the courses, and we hope to have some nice future internships as well. Paul Schack, the chair of uh, our English department, said that the learning experiences of having faculty, librarians, and these kinds of projects is wonderful. It's an incredible process for the students to undergo and really the kind of learning experience that he really appreciates. Lastly, our Open SUNY Textbook Program, a collaborative publishing of open textbooks across SUNY, is a powerful opportunity to reduce costs for students. It's an opportunity to support faculty authorship and enhance learning. One of my favorite authors who just recently got published with us um, was ecstatic about seeing her textbook being written on by her students on an iPad because she had never seen anyone engage a textbook like that before. Because if it's in print and it costs a lot, you don't want to write on it or the bookstore won't buy it back. So for her, it was an engaging experience that was really surprised her with an open textbook. The library and library publishing mission serve the campus mission of creating a rich learning-centered environment. There are more tangential benefits. Perhaps most important is enabling innovation. Publishing enables faculty, libraries, and colleges an opportunity to rethink scholarly communication, collaboration, and resource sharing. Thank you. As somebody who once worked a very long time ago as an actor, I have to tell you that it is wonderful to work with people who hit their marks. Um, so our, what I failed to say before and, and is that our goal was to outline for each of these institutions the basic organization of their library publishing programs and then to talk about alignment. Uh, alignment of mission alignment of policies, and I think some alignment of practice. And I think they've laid a good foundation for that. And Sorrell actually took us a long way into that discussion, which is a great transition. So the first thing I want to ask our speakers is, if you want to make further comments about the mission, since we've seen some things about organization, are there ways in which the organization is designed to serve a mission? Is it a mission of scholarly publishing, or is it a broader mission of the institution, whether that's the library or the, uh, uh, the university, and where you see alignments and gaps? OK. <laughs> One 
One thing I would want to add um, to the question of really the mission of library publishing and how it might differ or relate to that of traditional publishing is when I read that question, I kind of asked myself, well, why do we call it library publishing, not university publishing? What's the difference and, you know, and what are those um, similarities? And you already have the missions of like university presses and et cetera up there. And I did go and look at the um, LPC mission, which says, based on core library values, our mission is to foster collaboration, share knowledge, and develop common practices, all in service of publishing and distributing academic and scholarly works. And I do think that there is something important about core library values that makes library publishing a little bit different. And so I wanted to kind of mention as a case study a project um, done at Emory, and this is a place where I have the very good fortune of being able to brag on the work of my wonderful colleagues. Um, but Voyages um, is a transatlantic slave trade database. And if you're technology enabled and you want to look at it, it's slavevoyages.org. But to give you just a real brief overview, um, a history professor, Professor David Eltis, who is now an emeritus, had published books on the slave trade, including a CD-ROM with slave trade roots. And in 2006, um, we got grant funding and a multiple um, institution collaborative project basically ensued to create a database that has almost 40,000 slave voyages that are estimated to have transported 12 and a half million captive Africans across the Atlantic. And that database includes essays, estimates about the slave trade, interactive maps, images, an African names database, lesson plans, and a list of additional resources. It has an editorial board. It solicits updated information and new data from users. So it's, it was crowdsourced before crowdsourcing was in. And it receives about 1,000 hits a day. That's something to me that is different, that really would only have happened at least in 2006 in a library, in part because there was the availability of grant funding, um, in part because we had the, the programming expertise, the GIS expertise, the metadata expertise, you know, a, a whole host of people was needed to bring this into fruition. And one of the things that we have um, had to consider is how do we sustain this? This isn't a book you put on the shelf. And um, it does need maintenance, it needs preservation. So I also want to just touch on that I think one of the core missions of libraries is preservation. We are the ones who, who are the caretakers of our intellectual history. And so as part of digital publishing, I think we need to be considering how do we preserve these things? How do we make these things accessible over the long term? And I will tell you, this, these are not easy questions to answer. I mean, we have more questions than answers, so I can't be the sage on the stage. Um, but I can tell you that it is a question that should be asked for every publishing endeavor that we undertake. How do we sustain this? How are we going to preserve this? Not everything needs to be preserved, and that's okay, but I will tell you that the um, resources that we've invested at Voyages has meant that there hasn't been another project like that. So you do have to realize that resources are limited. And so when you are choosing what kind of publishing endeavors you take on, you really need this mission alignment with your library's mission, your institution's mission, because this is you know, a long-term endeavor often for some of these digital projects. So I'm going to uh, um, and give two answers, the first of which is um, the slide that didn't come up when I was uh, making my presentation that connects with the, with the uh, preservation goal that, uh, that Lisa has outlined, our repository services. And so um, uh, we've had uh, run an implementation of of DSpace for um, uh, since 2006, and uh, and have about uh, 18,000 objects in that. About half of which are just metadata records, uh, but the other 9,000 are divided between uh, uh, 
uh, principally uh, articles and also uh, theses and dissertations. But the repository services are an underlying layer for all of this because it really speaks to the preservation goal. And we certainly heard that in, in, uh, in yesterday's presentations, uh, particularly around the Hadi Trust. Um, what an important element of the library endeavor. And so where, so, you know, why is it that we're so important to our universities? And there are a lot of, you know, our support for teaching and learning is, is a tremendous asset. But the other thing that we play over, um, uh, over centuries is the, uh, is the long-term preservation legacy of knowledge generated in the academic era environment and beyond. And, um, and so that's a, a societal role, and uh, we need to play that for all it's worth because it's uh, critically important to, uh, um, to our uh, remaining robust and, uh, uh, and important on our campuses, uh, but, but beyond our campuses and to our provincial and state governments and, and federal governments. So, um, that's a, a really important part of the uh, combination of services. Uh, one of the um, benefits of the convergence that, that we're talking about is, is that the same staff that maintain the repository services are the ones that also run the, uh, um, the, the open access distribution for the university press. And in my other comment, um, I'll talk a little more about the press and what what our responsibilities are as, uh, as academic institutions and what is now being defined, I think Cyril spoke to this uh, eloquently, is, is that, um, that the public deserves access to this material. And they deserve access to it right now. Uh, and we should uh, assume that, uh, that that societal role of distributing access is a, is a valuable and valued uh, part of our role. And um, it takes a tremendous amount of time to, um, to create a scholarly monograph. Um, and then um, how many people read it? And how many people have access to it? And how many copies are sold? Um, the, the numbers, the, all of those numbers matter. And so talking about that role um, in terms of subsidies for university presses. Um, universities require them to uh, operate uh, in a certain fashion that assumes that they're going to uh, generate sufficient funding to cover their costs. Uh, usually those costs are not actually uh, accurate counts because they disregard all of those things that would be necessary to a normal uh, commercial operation, uh, but, but in fact that they are supposed to generate uh, sufficient funds to, to cover their operating costs. Um, if that operating cost is expended to provide a very limited distribution for that scholarly information and limit it to a scholarly environment, what has been gained by that? Uh, if we're going to subsidize that process, why don't we actually spend that money to attain a much greater goal, which is broad and immediate um, public and scholarly access to that material, which will lead to a much broader uh, resonance of that, uh, of that knowledge in society. Well said, both of you. I, I, the organizational structure and what could be improved are really important conversations that we really need to have. Our scholarly communication team and publishing team are doing amazing work. Um, one has interviewed all of the faculty or half the faculty to know about their research needs while the other was developing the platforms to publish with. Together they launched a scholarship and publishing website for the campus and developing the documentation needed to support an ever-growing in interest in publishing with us. Recent hires have to be there. So we, we recently hired a electronic resources a digital scholarship librarian, a publishing and web services developer, and an editor and production manager. 
libraries have to invest in this future, and it does take people, um, and it's very important for the future. Working together, we can handle a lot, of, a lot more projects and opportunities heading our way, but for improvements, we have to develop the copy editing, proofreading capacity that not only our efforts have, but as a community, as a group of interested publishing, library publishing, we have to grow our capacity at, at libraries. We have three sources. One is librarians from institutions across SUNY and New York, and we're developing that as we go in our projects. The other is freelance, paying for freelance, and the last is the paid student internships. This is a unique opportunity, I think, to organize our professional development for our librarians and our students, and I think it's one of the things that we're excited about, but also daunted by. It's yet another program to manage. Finding synergies between library instruction, instructional design, and publishing are also gonna be increasingly important in what we do. How to, however, I should say, equally important to finding those synergies is finding balance and the role of cl uh, role clarity between position, function, service, Organizational transformation and changing the rules uh, requires a lot of thoughtfulness. Lastly, but of vital importance, is if we're going to clarify this opportunity, which is, I call it, an academic-friendly publishing model, we have to clarify its value to the colleges and universities. We have to make it really clear what we're providing because that's an opportunity to help them as they're going through tremendous pressures to change. If they have to scale up and yet control costs, hey, that sounds familiar. I'm really familiar with this problem. Libraries can help because we faced that about 15 years ago. So how do we help the colleges and how do they recognize that support? We can do it as a community, but we can't do it alone. Thank you. Um, since we've talked about mission and organization, I'm now going to ask our panelists to drill down to some more specifics, specifically about collection priorities and about money, which I think you've heard uh, already developed. I also want to take the, the chair's privilege to um, reinforce and agree with something that Tom just said, because I think one of the most important, this relates to money and we'll get back to that, one of the most important arguments that we can make when we're talking about library publishing programs on our campuses is that access is value. And the more people who have access to the works we are publishing, the better the return on, our, on the investment. And if we can get our campuses to think in terms of ROI that way, in that broader way, it's much easier, in my opinion, to get some support for what we're trying to do. All of which is just me, yeah, getting up on my soapbox, but let me get Good. down from the soapbox here <laughs> and, and ask some specific questions. And this one, uh, and by the way, the intent here is for them to answer questions until I would guess about 10 after at which point we really do want to involve you in the conversation. So uh, please be thinking about the things that we haven't said that you'd like to hear. Um, so Lisa talked a little bit about this, I think. Um, do you all have specific policies, whether they're formal or informal, about how you, do, how you collect what, what you will and will not publish? in your library publishing programs, and how do you make those decisions? And I'll, I'll make it very concrete. At my institution, we are getting asked to host journals on our open journal system that have virtually no relationship to our campus. And I'll bet many of you have had those requests too. Um, so you know, how do you make the decisions about what it is that is important to you uh, in your library publishing program, and how does that align with the other things you've talked about, the mission and and I don't, I don't have a particular order in mind, so, you know. Maybe I should. <laughs> yes, your, your previous note will uh, you know, talk about it for 20 minutes. Anyway, um, uh, so thinking about the, the way it relates to the university, um, it happens, uh, and some of this is, is probably more particular 
to Canada, but, um, but certainly applicable in the U.S., is um, our relationship with an organization called uh, Access Copyright, um, which is, a, uh, is an organization that clears copyright for uh, educational and research use uh, of, of published material. Um, uh, not unlike the copy house clear it, copy clear copyright clearance center. Yes. <laughs> CCC. We're better with that. Yes. Anyway, um, and uh, but um, they um, about um, three and a half years ago proposed to increase um, the cost to uh, campuses across the country. Um, by what amounted to um, about four to five um, hundred percent increase. And um, so for the University of Calgary, that would have taken a, a, uh, about a million dollar a year expense to about uh, three and a half million dollars. And so many institutions agreed to um, well, we didn't agree, but we came to it separately um, that we wanted to opt out of this system and that we would support our own copyright compliance. And the library had been uh, doing copyright work uh, for a long time. Uh, there were a lot of reasons why we needed to have a, 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 a copyright officer. And um, uh, so we were well positioned to take over this university responsibility. And, uh, and it's a real responsibility because uh, one of the things that we assumed was that one of the opt-out institutions uh, would be sued uh, by access copyright and um, not fortunately, but, um, <coughs> but I can't help but be glad it was York University. Um, <laughs> as we thought it would be York, Calgary, or UBC. Uh, and uh, so, so uh, we weren't the one out of three. Uh, I will say that all of us are contributing to the, uh, the legal fund for the defense because it's a really important defense uh, nationally. But what it did was is that it put the uh, library and our copyright knowledge uh, and compliance capabilities at the center of the university. And so it gets into um, uh, and into every faculty member's environment in a way. And, it, and it's just an expansion of what we, we did every day. <coughs> uh, and it connects well with our, um, with what, as, as I say, with uh, collection management and, uh, uh, and access, student access to information as well. Um, regarding our, um, our Canadian Journals hosting program, uh, it's certainly not limited to uh, journals published on the University of, of Calgary campus. Uh, we broadened our program in response to a national initiative. And so uh, we know that particularly journals in the uh, humanities and social sciences in Canada do not get a broad international distribution. And so we certainly see that as a national role we're playing rather than just a, uh, uh, a campus specific role. And uh, I, I don't think there's any question from our campus regarding the appropriateness of this larger role. And in that role, we're part of a, of a nation, nationwide uh, effort to um, maintain broad distribution and broaden the distribution for those journals. I will say right at this point in time uh, uh, with the um, uh, Canadian academic journals, there is a, uh, it is a, a somewhat contentious relationship as they um, in some ways seek to maintain uh, fairly traditional uh, distributions of their journals when in fact their capacity to do that is steadily declining. And so through the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, we're trying to develop a partnership that increases their likelihood of survival and at the same time um, uh, supports them in adopting uh, an open access mandate for access to that material. And so the <coughs> is 
um, is let's, <coughs> let's devote money to a common cause, but let's in fact not use that money, new money, to maintain old traditions. And so we've taken a strong position with them, and uh, and hopefully we're we're moving in the right direction. The press is directly associated with some of our academic units out of the nine areas that we. Um, uh, that we have series in. Four of them are directly associated with campus uh, uh, disciplinary uh, institutes and so forth, but it's certainly, um, uh, you know, we, we receive manuscripts from across Canada and, and uh, as well as the U.S. So, Two points, um, one on the selection of materials and, and how selection is done. And we um, have really learned that we should not be the selectors in the library, that we really need <coughs> faculty and subject expert um, review of proposals and projects. And so um, for the Emory Center for Digital Scholarship, there is actually a faculty governance board um, that essentially approves large projects. Now, we have kind of a tiered approach. Smaller projects don't really need to go through that, um, that process. But we've really found that that editorial board function, if you will, um, is essential. I mean, one is to really kind of judge the, the scholarly merit, if you will, of, of the project. And the other aspect um, that we found to really be essential is the sustainability needs of the project and or the the publication proposal and that's not simply technologically can we sustain this it is also is the scholar in this for the long haul or is this a, a one-off sort of project is this something where you know if if the editor gets worn out and being an editor is a hard job is there some structure in place where this moves to someone else um, you know, or is this just simply someone's really bright idea, which may be a good idea, but which they may not personally be able to really sustain over the longer term. So those are kind of the two things that I think really we've learned over time are important considerations uh, in that kind of selection process. The other thing that um, I really want to talk about that, that you touched on, Tom, and that is copyright policy and copyright policy alignment with your mission. And so the, the lawyer in me can't help but remind us all that copyright comes from the Constitution. And it is for the progress of science and the useful arts. Sound familiar? Sound like our missions? The intent of copyright is to essentially incentivize creators to create. For, and they give creators a, exclusive rights for a limited time and then that content goes into the public domain so that it can be for the public good and a real part of that is essentially the idea that we all stand on the shoulders of giants that new knowledge can only be created based on past knowledge and so what has really happened is that scholarship cannot happen without fair use it isn't possible because we all are relying on what has gone before. And so I have, I have said before, um, if the library is the heart of the university, then fair use is the lifeblood. And so we really need to have fair use policies for our publications, and we need to exercise fair use. We don't want to be in a position where everything we do requires permission. Not that permission isn't appropriate in some circumstances, but library publishing needs to honor the rights of creators, and I think we do that very well. Um, we have a lot of author agreements that leave copyright with the author, but also we need to appropriately exercise fair use, and that needs to be reflected in the policies that we create. Um, to that end, uh, Kevin and I um, and a few others are working on a Coursera MOOC on copyright for higher education to be launched later this summer. We really feel, I'm speaking for Kevin as well, passionately that the higher education community needs to understand copyright and understand fair use um, and are kind of looking to put our money where our mouth is in, in offering a MOOC on that. 
And I also um, want to say that I think we need to defend fair use not only in our own actions, um, but for others as well. And to give you an example of that, um, the Emory Vaccine Center filed an amicus brief in the Hathi Trust Appeal. And you may be asking yourself, what the heck does the Emory Vaccine Center care about the Hathi Trust Appeal? So I will tell you. Um, the Emory Vaccine Center does what you would imagine. They're looking for vaccines for things. And one of the things about viruses um, is that they mutate. And so we have diseases that we think we've conquered, like whooping cough, that come back. So you need to really be able to understand a virus over the long term. Well, guess where knowledge about the long term is stored? In Hathi Trust. And so um, the Emory Vaccine Center, um, and there's actually a librarian who works there, really wrote a very compelling amicus brief, which is a friend of the court brief, around the, um, the use of Hathi Trust in this way for scientific research, looking for vaccines, and how this is important that this resource be available. So we not only need to defend fair use in what we do on campuses, but we need to take opportunities to defend it when it's threatened for others. Because if it's threatened for others, it's threatened for ourselves as well. So I will now step off my soapbox. <laughs> well, I like um, your comment, Tom, about access is value. I'd, I'd like to add access and selection is value. And, and I think that's what part of this question refers to. Um, at SUNY Geneseo, um, the Geneseo publications that we do, they're sort of an evolving uh, decision-making process. And it really, um, I want to credit Kate Pitcher, Bonnie Swagger, Corey Ha, and the other publishing team members for their development of really a consultation process from guide to plan to decision-makings about what are we going to publish and who are the stakeholders, what's the resources, what's the involvement. Um, and committed commitment long term is, is going to be key. We also want to say thanks to Columbia, Michigan Publishing, Cornell and RIT, um, and others who we've uh, looked at their processes and they've shared lots of good information. Much of our focus is around our region and the publications of our students and faculty because we see that as an important role. We now have an alumni and more alumni that are starting to be very interested in publishing with us. That brings up an interesting policy question. Who makes the decision for alumni works? And is it a for-profit enterprise for a university, a state university? So how do I decide this or not? You should see our discussions with the comptroller and council because it's an interesting question about where are the boundaries of library publishing and what makes sense. Now, if it's core to the mission, it would make sense that it, we can go ahead and, and go forward. So if we have student internships learning about copy editing and proofreading and working on design, hey, that works, right? Well, these are the questions that we have to answer. And so we're doing that one step at a time. As for open textbooks, the selection of actually the priority <coughs> or the imprint value is really critical. Open textbooks, as I think David Ernstead is just, um, what did he, how did he so eloquently state it? It's just the right thing to do. It makes sense. Well, that is one of the right things to do for a lot of reasons. But for our selection of open SUNY textbooks, I agree with you. Faculty involvement is really essential. So when we did our call for authors uh, last month or so, we had 46 manuscript proposals. Now, that's a lot, and we've got to decide on 16 for the next year. So how do we do it? How do we involve faculty in a review process? Not to replicate the university press model with an editorial advisory board and all of this. Um, we went with something innovative, and we're testing out an idea. We developed a rubric. We have all the criteria established, and we sent blind abstracts with some of the contents, like table of contents information of each abstract to 14 institutions in SUNY to distribute from the librarian to the faculty member and ask, what do you think about this abstract and this proposal for an open textbook? The criteria include, um, for a double blind review, how likely would you adopt this textbook? What courses does it fit at your institution? Um, what are its strengths? What could improve it? What's fundamental or essential for this textbook to have in this discipline? 
what we're essentially doing is developing a new market analysis for how faculty cooperate in a new enterprise. Now, it's, for me, an exciting process, laborious, but exciting. And um, there's always room for improvement. But from the reviews I'm getting back now, what we're really doing is also giving the authors a really good example of what it would take to improve this textbook, this work, to make it essential for teaching. Now, I love that part, because now librarians are really at the core of something very exciting, a conversation between teaching faculty, authoring faculty, and librarians about what is the future of curriculum resources, and what's our involvement in it? We're empowering the author and the, the reader. And it's quite an exciting process. Um, March 25th, we'll select our 16, so it'll be very fun. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one last question, uh, <laughs> maybe the hardest one. Uh, all of you have outlined very ambitious programs, and I'm very impressed by the things you want to do. How are you paying for them? And more specifically, uh, where is the money coming from? Is it moving from collection budgets? Is it special money? Is it grant money? How does the way you support your policy, your publishing program, align with the policies and missions that you've talked about, as well as the vision that you've talked about? And all of that in five to 10 minutes, please. <laughs> So it's different in every area. Um, uh, in the case of the, um, um, so I'll just sort of start down the list. Uh, in the case of the uh, journal hosting, uh, for open access journals, we don't charge anything for that service. Uh, we started out with a commitment of, uh, of three years that we would uh, support that uh, through the library budget. And um, I don't think we'll stop at the end of three years, but that was uh, a reasonable thing to, uh, to say to, uh, to get uh, journals uh, uh, involved. Uh, we do charge a very small hosting fee for non-open access journals. Uh, and while it doesn't cover the full cost, uh, probably it covers the incremental costs uh, mm -hmm. associated with those journals. So that's a, uh, that's a simple uh, library budget support. Um, the copyright service, as I said, the majority of that expense uh, at this point in time is actually covered directly by the, by the provost. It's, uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a base budget item at this point in time. We don't know what will be the uh, pace uh, of, the, of that ongoing service, but it is provided annually by the provost. But we also, the copyright officer was always on our budget anyway, so we continue to pay uh, for that component, and that individual serves a lot of other purposes uh, in the library besides just uh, administering the uh, copyright service. Um, regarding the, um, the university press, um, one is, is going open access has, uh, has been uh, a, uh, a successful venture in the sense that there are people now who, uh, and particularly groups of scholars who come to us because we're open access. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, one, we're, uh, we're getting some, uh, you know, we're attracting uh, significant manuscripts and people who want to publish uh, on a continuing basis uh, through us going forward. Um, so, uh, and, and for the, the first year that we were open access and we create print volumes, and I'll talk just a, a bit about that in a moment and the challenges that presents uh, in terms of funding, is that um, uh, the, uh, the director of the press that initiated this process um, actually came to me and, and she said, uh, uh, Tom, I, I hate to tell you this, but we're selling more print volumes than ever before. Um, and uh, so I think that's an important piece of the economics. Uh, it's leading uh, to more uh, course adoptions, uh, which do sell a significant uh, number of, 
of print volumes. Um, would we rather just be open <coughs> access, uh, I mean just electronic access? Uh, I'm not sure that that's uh, necessarily the case, but we also have um, a, a problem in terms of federal policy, uh, in terms of the way university presses are supported in, uh, in Canada. And so while the uh, Social Science and Humanities Research Council is highly supportive of, of open access, uh, there are still many government programs for support of things like university press that are directly tied to the number of printed copies you produce. And, we, and, and don't count uh, online downloads and so forth. So, there's, uh, so it's a real pain uh, that we write proposals for funding that are based on print copies when that's not the way we would like to justify the press. So there are these, uh, in, in, uh, you know, these conflicts uh, within the environment um, that make it challenging uh, to succeed economically as well as, as in terms of, of mission. Um, and I'll also uh, speak to searching for efficiencies as well, and I, and I think this is something that um, that university presses um, are probably not uninterested, and there's some examples, but we're not talking about becoming a single press, but in Alberta, there are, our, um, province of Alberta, there are three um, uh, university presses, uh, Athabasca, the University of Alberta, and the University of Calgary, and Next Wednesday, uh, Ram Crow is going to be on the campus doing a consultancy for us to talk about how could we actually do our back end um, to do that in a singular, united fashion and to similarly do uh, uh, common marketing uh, so that in fact that we would remain in terms of having our own editorial boards and so forth, uh, three points of selection and then three major in prints for distribution, but that we would in fact cut our costs down. Um, Athabasca and Calgary are open access and the University of Alberta is not, and that provides, that'll be an interesting challenge for uh, uh, Ram and, uh, and, and advising on us on this. But um, we are uh, pursuing that, as I, I've already answered the question around um, uh, the way we support our uh, open access authors fund. And, um, but I think because we've been able to present this to the faculty as a common integrated program, uh, that the administration of the university feels a, a sense of ownership around the program as a whole, and so that it serves us in many ways. I also think as the digital humanities and data management uh, ramp up, uh, that in fact that the importance of this constellation to the university as a whole will grow greater and hopefully funding to support that. So commitment does really show where your values are, um, where you, when you put your money where your mouth is. And so when the Emory Center for Digital Scholarship was created, there were two co-directors that were essentially new positions. One is a faculty member, um, and the other co-director um, was the director of ESIT. So um, essentially, you know, those were two kind of key positions that we felt in order to really launch the um, Center for Digital Scholarship, and you know, it was a repurposing of existing positions. I will also say that the library over the long term has supported um, open access publishing and specifically an open access journal called Southern Spaces um, by having a host of graduate students who have worked on that journal. And Sarah and Meredith are here if you want to talk to them about Southern Spaces. But um, Alan Tullis has been the editor, um, who's the co-director of ECDS, has been the editor of Southern Spaces um, for its 10-year history. It turns 10 years old. And um, I'm channeling Alan now when I tell you that one of the things that he um, very much values and, and sees directly aligned with mission is the fact that Southern Spaces is an opportunity for graduate students to not just learn about 
digital publishing, but to do it. And Southern Spaces is an interactive um, multimedia journal. So there's video, there's all kinds of things. And so they're not just kind of learning from a distance about this, they're actually really learning how to produce scholarship. And that's really served um, a number of them well who've gone on to other positions. So that's a matter of kind of aligning what you're supporting with the mission of the university. Um, the space for ECDS has been remodeled, which came out of facilities funding. Um, and the collections budget does support our open access fund. It supports our open education initiative, et cetera. But I will say that the amount of money that we invest in that, when you look at comparison of the collection budget as a whole, is really very small. And so um, over the longer term, what I really hope is, as you said, Tom, that we invest more in what we're creating and less in what we're just buying from others, so. I like that very much. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, mention um, Ed Rivenberg, the previous director at SUNY Genesee used to say sweat equity, and I always like that term, but I always wanna say smartness too. Um, we, we share a lot of expertise and, uh, across a community of libraries. Uh, SUNY Geneseo is the administrator of a 75 library network in New York called the IDS Project, and we're the PI for Open SUNY Textbooks, which is about 11 participating libraries. But I've already mentioned that 20% of our librarians and staff are involved in the publishing team, we, with three full-time positions really dedicated to the publishing field. We've received SUNY Innovative Instruction Technology Grant funding and library funding from several SUNY libraries to promote and develop this open SUNY textbook program. Uh, the two pilots alone, uh, is the direct cost investment is $120,000 as at, from today, not including the in-kind contributions of many, many libraries. For other publishing projects, we're using library operating funds and foundation funds to support some of the expenses, freelance copy editing, professional development. Given that we pay a half a million dollars for traditionally published materials, it may not seem like a lot. However, with the collaboration and sharing of service and practice, we are collectively transforming scholarly communications at SUNY Geneseo, a staff of 31 and I'm really impressed with the, the librarians and staff there. Now, for the Open SUNY Textbook Program, we are developing a sustainability model. I've gotta come up with this plan. It's a project that has significant growth potential. One model is for open textbooks, and the other model, with the help of students in an entrepreneurship program, they're great. They're working with Professor Albers, and they're developing what's called an affordable textbook model will be able to present this to SUNY saying, here are two different models to look at programmatically. What do you want to do? Um, I, I want to briefly mention, we have more possibilities than we can imagine. One of my favorite stories to tell is the story of Better World Books. I don't know if you're all familiar with them. All the libraries were complaining about what to do with discarded books and you saw that libraries are complaining about budgets. Better World Books essentially asked libraries for their books and would sell them and give some royalty back to the libraries. Essentially, they've created a multi-million dollar industry on something libraries said, I don't know what to do with. And the other is they gave libraries some money, but they created a whole industry out of it. We have that opportunity today, and thank you. And now the rest of us are very impressed at what SUNY Geneseo is accomplishing. <laughs> so thank you for sharing it. Uh, we have 13 minutes for your questions. Um, I think we've...